This video essay is brought to you by Mubi. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash do cinema. Since the dawn of cinema, there has always been a clear theme of good versus evil, usually with the hero winning at the end. But as filmmaking has grown and developed, so have its characters. As kids, we love heroes, but as we grow older, we start to understand villains more and more, maybe even to the point where we start to empathize with them. That's because we learn from a young age that being anything other than good has no intrinsic value. It is only later that we realize the world is not as black and white as we were once told. There are, however, characters who do not belong to the hero nor villain categories. Those who reside between the two opposing forces of good and evil, like Walter White, the 2019 Joker, Patrick Bateman, Zuko, the narrator, and the list goes on. Philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche proposed we look beyond good and evil, and explore the gray area in between. Why are these characters so popular nowadays? Is there maybe something inside of us that's craving to embody the dark side? To answer this question, we need to know what all these characters, and we as humans, consist of. Swiss philosopher Carl Jung made the distinction between the persona and the shadow self. The persona being our outward face we present to the world, and the shadow, our darker side, often left untouched. As we grow up and try to navigate ourselves in the modern world, we develop certain characteristics that we and others deem likable. Without often knowing, we carefully craft an image of ourselves that we present to the outside world, in order to be accepted or liked. Why are we doing this? Well, most of the time we're forced to because it has many benefits. It's easier to build relationships, establish trust, and often comes with financial gain as well. In other words, those characteristics are safe. So one might ask, what's wrong with it then? Well, along the way, we reject those characteristics that we don't find likable or necessary. Which brings us to a character like Patrick Bateman, who's obsessed with how others view him. He's doing his utmost best to craft a quote-unquote perfect persona. He's applying a literal face mask every morning, metaphorically masking his shadow self. And that's how the persona starts to serve as a substitution of one's true self in society. And Carl Jung describes it as the conformity archetype. But suppressing our true self can cause serious conflict down the line, as explored by other characters like Walter White in Breaking Bad, the narrator in Fight Club, even Bruce Wayne in Batman, Zuko in Avatar, and Arthur Fleck in The Joker. American Psycho will therefore be the cornerstone of this character study, but I'll branch out into many other movies and series as we go on and explore what's behind our persona. All of those years, living the life of someone I didn't even know. parts as a human being that are underdeveloped, we have left behind and avoided looking at. This is the shadow self, a set of personality traits that are deemed undesirable, either by the person itself or the environment. In essence, the qualities that you're ought not to be. Therefore these traits are pushed away into the unconscious because what's not accepted is often banished or forgotten. According to Carl Jung, every person carries a shadow. But the more it is repressed, the denser it becomes. You could say it's literally our blind spot. You don't know what you don't know. But just because it is unconscious doesn't mean it isn't present. You see, the symbol of yin and yang doesn't represent evil and good. It's a symbol of harmony. And although dark and light are opposite, there is a piece of them in both. Carl Jung warned us that if you fail to understand the shadow or that we have one, we can't understand the root cause of our bad decisions. He believes that the pathway to completion as a human being is through the embodiment of the monster. Embodiment of the monster. That's the discovery of the shadow. So in order to transform as a person, one needs to look at the parts he does not want to look at. 
because in that untapped shadow, a repressed side of the self also lie characteristics that are needed to become whole. And just like Prince Zuko, who has been raised by the evil regime of the Fire Nation, one needs to free himself from the confines of their persona in order to get to their true self. Leave it behind. Confronting your shadow means confronting pain. Fight Club is established as a way for modern men to access their shadow self by literally experiencing physical pain and aggression. In a society where men have been emasculated, they feel the need to regain their tribal manliness. Therefore, the narrator unconsciously creates an alter ego called Tyler Durden, his shadow self, who embodies all the characteristics that he has repressed. Nietzsche said that very frequently people are afraid to do things that are regarded as bad, and instead of admitting that they are acting cowardly, they tell themselves that they are acting morally. But solely being good and always avoiding conflict is not what human beings are like. So Tyler teaches the narrator to become everything but good, obedient, and cowardly. Nietzsche's and Jung's philosophy are very Tyler Durdian in that sense. This brings us to the importance of the anti-hero, dark characters that are deeply flawed and lack conventional heroic attributes. The anti-hero is a conflicted character who often has a cloudy moral compass, but that's what makes them realistic, complex, and oftentimes even likable. Anti-heroes confront us with the devil, the shadow within us, our fears and weaknesses, and it's no coincidence that the oldest story ever written, the Epic of Gilgamesh, was an anti-heroic tale, the story of a brutal tyrant who foolishly tried to defeat death something no human being can escape. Fight Club is a way to balance the scales, so to speak. The irony of the narrator buying a yin and yang table is that he's not in balance himself. So Tyler forcefully balances his life by destroying his possessions. He explains to the narrator that he doesn't want to die without any scars. Tyler's philosophy gives the narrator purpose for a while, but he begins to be consumed by it and sees the men in Fight Club radicalize. We need to be impulsive at times and we need to take risks, but at the same time we got to make sure our shadow does not take full control. I hold at your neck the gom java. A poison needle. Instant death. Confronting the shadow often happens on an emotional level. In Dune, Paul has to encounter his biggest fears and endure all the mental pain and suffering to prove that he's the chosen. But if he can't, he'll die. Enough. Paul is scared of becoming an evil tyrant and sees visions of a falling kingdom. And like Prince Zuko, who's struggling with his tyrant father and difficult childhood, the shadow often comes in the form of past trauma. In Zuko's fever dream, he is torn between good and evil, and sees visions of himself becoming like his father, the person that scarred him physically and mentally at a young age for not being aggressive enough. Since then, he only knows how to fuel his actions out of anger. And Bruce Wayne, who witnessed his parents' murder and then becomes known as the billionaire orphan. However, secretly he confronts his trauma by avenging his parents' death and eradicating crime under the name of Batman, the shadow self of Bruce Wayne's persona. The anti-hero is the shadow of a hero, that's why he's often called the dark hero, and it's the thing that the persona needs to incorporate to become the hero or the villain when left unconscious and repressed. A war in my name! Everyone shouting my name! You know who you are. You know who you are. Get off me! You did this to me! The shadow is a big part of who you are, and the longer it's left in the dark, the more power it will have over us. Arthur Fleck, better known as the Joker, is an example of what happens when the shadow gets repressed. The movie explores the concept of the sad clown paradox, which came from a study published in 1981 titled Pretend the World is Funny and Forever. It explains how sad it is to see someone work super hard to make people laugh while not being happy himself. We learned that the Joker wasn't always the supervillain he is known for. 
we get to experience the tragic tale of a failed and lonely stand-up comedian. Lots of people are cruel to him. He has a laughing disorder and there is no money to provide mental health care. We feel the outside world closing in on him and all of the pressures that he is under. And so we believe that he essentially is a good man, even though his actions are terribly wrong. The film kind of makes you want to joke or to avenge because of all the terrible things that happened to him. This is also why we have empathy for Walter White, a science teacher with a family, your typical persona. But when he finds out he has lung cancer, he decides to hide it from his family and temporarily starts making drugs in order to make enough money to secure his family's future. His motivations are really quite understandable. He wants what's good for his family and for himself. But not many people voluntarily want to confront their pain, weaknesses or trauma, simply because it's scary as hell. So what often happens is that the shadow stays repressed and then things can get very, very dark. Have you seen what it's like out there, Murray? Do you ever actually leave the studio? They think that we'll just sit there and take it like good little boys, that we won't werewolf and go wild. You finished? There is a fine line between the anti-hero and the villain. The anti-hero still operates for the greater good, but when the monster is left uncontrolled and you lose perspective, you might live long enough to see yourself become the villain. You clearly don't know who you're talking to, so let me clue you in. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot, and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. What we see in Walter White is an ordinary man driven to extremes and disappearing down a rabbit hole. By doing the wrong thing for the right reasons and not telling the truth, he spirals towards increasing villainy. His initial motivations become hollow validations. Run. Patrick Bateman is a walking paradox. He preaches returning to moral values, but does the complete opposite. His crafted persona is slowly falling apart. It's a story of how image over individual eventually takes its toll. Tonight, I, uh, <laughs> I just had <laughs> to kill a lot of people. And um, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm going to get away with it this time. All these characters weren't aware of their shadow in the first place, and so the monster inside was able to grow beyond their control. There are no more barriers to cross. All I have in common with the uncontrollable and the insane, the vicious and the evil, all the mayhem I have caused and my utter indifference toward it, I have now surpassed. My pain is constant and sharp, and I do not hope for a better world for anyone. No new knowledge can be extracted from my telling. This confession has meant nothing. However, there is a way we can prevent things from going this far, and it's by understanding that deep down inside of us all lies a piece of evil. And only when a person is able to master his darkest shadow, he can become his true self. Zuko realized he became a monster, but he doesn't know how to control it. Therefore, he has to completely relearn firebending so that it isn't fueled by hatred. And Aang also needs firebending, the thing he feared most, to become the avatar and master all elements. Fire is known to be dangerous, and despite being a possible force of destruction, they have to learn that it's also a force of life. The shadow too doesn't only contain negative characteristics, it's our animalistic side. It's the source of both creative and destructive energies. This inner relationship with the monster is beautifully expressed in Harry Potter, who has a piece of evil lodged deeply within him. Because to be truly good, Harry first has to understand the source of evil in order to stand up to Voldemort. There's a reason Harry can speak with snakes. There's a reason he can look into Lord Voldemort's mind. A part of Voldemort lives inside him. This is what Carl Jung meant with rather being whole than good. That means being capable of showing aggression, defying convention, and taking your own road when it is really needed. To quote Jordan Peterson, it's necessary to become a monster, or even a lot of a monster, when the circumstances demand it. And then know how to control it. The English word meek is nowadays translated as being gentle or weak, but a fuller understanding comes from its Greek origin, praus, which means strength under control. It's like when you have a sword and you know how to use it and are courageous enough. 
when you have to. <laughs> I don't, don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? No, you. You complete me. The reason why the interaction between Batman and the Joker is so interesting is because the Joker knows that Batman is not his opposite. That doesn't mean Batman is just as evil as the Joker. He's a good man, but he is no Christ. And so the Joker is constantly reeling him in. You're more like me than you would like to believe. You see, in their last moments, people show you who they really are. Everybody has that piece of evil inside of him, which is why heroes and villains are a lot more alike than we think. They oftentimes have the same backstory too, which is a history of pain. The hero is almost always an orphan, and the villain will have some kind of scar on their face, indicating their painful backstory. But the key difference between the villain and the hero is one thing. It's how they respond to pain. Because the villain says, the world hurt me, and I'm gonna hurt it back as much as I can. But the hero says, the world hurt me, and I'm not gonna let this happen to anybody else. It's how you respond to pain that eventually decides whether you become the hero or the villain. To bring another's energy, your own spirit must be unbendable, or you will be corrupted and destroyed. At the end of the day, we have to accept the fact that we're flawed and consider it a part of being. But evil is powerless, as long as the good are unafraid. When a hero has limitations, then the plot becomes the challenge to overcome them. Just like in our own lives, there are certain challenges, setbacks, and sometimes even traumas we have to overcome in order to move on and transform. Because without limitations, there is no plot, and no plot means no life. They think I'm hiding in the shadows, but I am the shadows. Thank you so much for watching, and if you found this video interesting or helpful in one way or another, I got something for you. Because it is by watching movies that we can learn more about character psychology or ourselves, I would highly recommend checking out Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service and a place to watch beautiful cinema. Every day Mubi premieres a new film from iconic directors to emerging auteurs, so there is always a wide variety of choices. With Mubi, each and every film is hand selected, so it's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. They are currently showing movies with similar themes as we talked about today, such as Taste of Cherry, Pain and Glory, and the documentary Heart of Darkness. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash ducinema. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash ducinema for an entire month of great cinema for free. And I hope to see you in the next video.